it's my pleasure to say a few words about this lecture series, uh, about our topic this evening, and about our esteemed speaker, Dr. Jennifer Besty. Each semester, the Flannery Lecture is made possible by the Flannery Endowment, which was established in 1973 by Maud and Milo Flannery to promote the rigorous study of Catholic theology here at Gonzaga University. 46 years on, it's a wonderful gift to stand in their tradition and to witness the variety of events and speakers that their endowment has made possible, which have seeded our community with reflection and action upon the challenges and opportunities that face the Catholic Church in our time. We have with us this evening a member of the Flannery family who has faithfully attended these lectures over many years. Michael Flannery is here uh, with his husband, Dean Lynch. <laughs> Thanks to both of you, Michael and Dean, uh, for supporting this lecture series and beyond. Uh, thanks for your friendship over the years, and thank you for your great aunt and great uncle, uh, without whom we would not be here this evening. Um, and in a Catholic spirit of penance, I confess that I wrongly understood them to be your parents, which <laughs> you told me recently would have you be too old. <laughs> so thank you for that clarification. Because of our topic this evening, we're privileged as well to have with us a group of highly skilled Catholic professionals here in Spokane who serve on the Diocesan Review Board of the Diocese of Spokane and Eastern Washington. Since 2002, the U.S. Catholic Church has mandated uh, a mostly lay review board to serve within each local diocese to review allegations of abuse and to provide lay professional advice to the local bishop. Uh, to those members who are here, thanks so much for the work you do and for joining us tonight. <laughs> their work is necessary and the need of the church as a whole to come alongside their work is necessary because the church is beset by an array of self-inflicted wounds related to clergy sexual abuse. Arguably, the church's response to date has been confined mostly to prevention and underdeveloped in the domains of a ministry of healing and the growth of a communal culture owned by us all, which would facilitate through a range of relationships and responsibilities, the processing and the healing of sexual abuse, traumatic wounding. Facing abuse, processing it, and doing so in the midst of wise and sensitive relationships. This is a prerequisite for healing. Cultures within the church which frustrate this potential for a victim first and child first orientation simply compound the crisis currently experienced. As we know from trauma studies and from Pope Francis's 2018 letter to Catholics worldwide, the quality of a community's response to persons wounded by abuse is a telling variable in victims' prospects for healing. Dr. Deborah Hunsinger, a pastor and theologian who recently retired from Princeton Theological Seminary, does not mince words here. She writes that traumatic events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. Within families and communities so affected, understanding, she writes, becomes a part of the holding environment that contains anxiety and increases a sense of empowerment. Hunsinger's call for a relational home or a holding environment points us toward the church's mission now as a post-traumatic community, where the church organizes itself as a relational home and a holding environment. It will have moved beyond Francis's worry, Pope Francis's worry, that we remain indifferent. And for our purposes tonight, it can help to think of our space here this evening as a holding environment knowing that this topic can be triggering for those traumatized by an array of harms. But to date, work to bring about this change in culture within the church has been shared unevenly. 
The attitude of indifference remains, locally and globally, and is evident in a variety of dysfunctional patterns cohering under the rubric of clericalism, which is a form of power maintenance among some clergy, but also among laity, which protects narcissism and exceptionalism, and thus undermines ecclesial self-awareness, love for others, and ultimately the mission of the church. Clericalism remains ingredient to the culture of the church in an array of feelings widely evident today. Feelings like the church needs to move on from this issue, that victims pose inconvenience or discomfort to the rest of us, that the church already dealt with this problem in previous years or court cases or bankruptcies, or that we can't hold quite enough liturgies of lament to satisfy criticism, and so why bother to hold any? That liturgical opportunities such as the homily or prayers of the faithful are not suitable opportunities uh, for uh, not suitable opportunities for truth telling and repentance for the crime and sin of abuse, or feelings that the media and secular culture won't give the church a break, and thus we substitute ourselves as victims in place of the real victims of abuse or in feelings to do with the reluctance of many priests to be seen visibly engaged as servant leaders in this aspect of the church's work, or in the tendency of theologians and Catholic presses not to conduct much research in this area and not to publish much in this area. These patterns of response reduce to affect, and they capture the many ways in which this crisis has wounded us, wounded our affect as a church, though differently than direct victims of abuse. The inability to feel and to feel rightly as a member one to another of the body of Christ frustrates the church's own mission in and to the world. We are in need of constructive approaches and a refocus. Since 2007, if not before, Dr. Jennifer Bestie has been for Catholic audiences an exemplar of how to do theology and ethics in the presence of traumatic wounding. Her writing is a must for anyone seeking to contribute on this matter, and many students at Gonzaga are familiar with her writing. Dr. Bestie is a professor of theology at the College of St. Benedict in Minnesota, where she holds the Koch Chair for Catholic Thought and Culture. Her research and teaching focuses upon sexual ethics, trauma theory, feminist ethics, qualitative research on children, and children and Catholicism. Among her many publications are a book entitled God and the Victim, Traumatic Intrusions on Grace and Freedom, and several journal articles exploring the mediation of divine grace in the context of sexual abuse and healing. We are grateful truly to host her, grateful for her willingness to join us this evening while on sabbatical leave from her institution and eager to reflect with her on a just response to clergy sexual abuse. Dr. Bessie's talk this evening is entitled Envisioning a Just Response to the Catholic Clergy Abuse Crisis. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Good evening, everyone. John, I want to thank you for inviting me to Gonzaga to give the Flannery Lecture. It is really one of the greatest honors I've ever received, and I, it means a lot to be here with you. <clears throat> I also want to thank the Religious Studies Department. I have had a wonderful last night and today um, having rich conversations with faculty and students. Uh, the faculty read some of my research and they gave me all of this brilliant feedback a little while ago, and so I just want to thank you. I've had a really amazing time here. I'd like to just share a little uh, background to help you understand why I would uh, spend uh, really 25 years studying trauma and the clergy sexual abuse crisis. Um, it was not what I had planned for. In 1995, I was a Master's of Divinity student at Vanderbilt. 
And I was trying to decide if I wanted to become a psychiatrist or become a medical ethicist. So I had gotten into medical school and the medical school was willing to give me three years to study medical ethics. I decided to get a part-time job uh, as a mental health worker at the Vanderbilt Psychiatric Hospital to discern which way I wanted to go. Uh, and they assigned me to the children and adolescent units. And I was amazed how the majority of the children and adolescents who came in and were hospitalized uh, were uh, victims of child sexual abuse. <sighs> I can't, there aren't words to describe um, how deeply, how, how deeply shocked I was at, at how harmed they were physically, psychologically, and relationally. Uh, but it, it, it deeply impacted me. And these encounters would often just disrupt my other life as a divinity student. For the, they assaulted my most cherished beliefs about human freedom and God's goodness. The truth of common Christian refrains I'd heard all my life, such as God never gives you more than you can handle. And everything happens for a reason, simply eviscerated. In one of my master's theology papers at Vanderbilt, I asked, do people who experience severe trauma like sexually abused children really have the freedom to overcome their self-destructive actions and cultivate healthy relationships with themselves and others? How can a God who is loving allow these kids to be subject to such human cruelty? How can Christians honestly have faith in the power of God's grace when confronted with the radical suffering of these children? I graduated from Vanderbilt and I went to Yale for my doctoral program in ethics. And I remember feeling a sense of relief in those first few weeks because it was so much easier to just study theology than be with those children. I tried to push away those memories and focus on medical ethics, but I ended up writing my dissertation on how trauma, and I focused on child sexual abuse, challenges Catholic conceptions of God's grace and human freedom. I was just finishing my last chapter about how the Catholic Church could support and foster child sexual abuse survivors in their communities when the Boston clergy scandal broke out in 2002. I have been researching and writing about how to respond justly to sexual violence ever since. So we can begin. <clears throat> if you do a literature review on the clergy sexual abuse crisis, the main focus among scholars, Catholic leaders, and journalists has been to focus on what are the causes that contributed to the, the abuse and the cover-up, and then, and then there's uh, proposals for how can we reform. So I'll just mention several of them that, that get a lot of attention. Uh, and Pope Francis himself has said patriarchal clericalism, like Dr. Shevlin was just uh, explaining, uh, is the root of this crisis. And I think this is very insightful. Um, along with that, there's the lack of power among the laity to share in church decision-making, oversight, and accountability. Uh, many scholars also talk about the culture surrounding mandatory celibacy, Catholic teachings on sexuality and gender, insufficient psychosexual and spiritual formation in seminaries, and there's been a lot of focus on perpetrators' individual traits. While these are very important areas uh, in need of reform, I am going to focus on some other issues that I think are being overlooked and underemphasized in our dominant discourse about justice and clergy sexual abuse. I sense that we need to go much deeper than remaining at the cognitive level of analyzing causes if we are to have hope for genuine reform. And so I'd like to begin with a quote from Pope Francis. Last year at this time, the Global Summit on uh, Clergy Sexual Abuse of Minors occurred in Rome. And Pope Francis stated, the crimes of sexual abuse offend our Lord cause physical, psychological, and spiritual damage to the victims, and harm the community of the faithful. 
In order that these phenomena in all their forms never happen again, a continuous and profound conversion of hearts is needed, attested by concrete and effective actions that involve everyone in the church. I think this is deeply insightful. I think at the, at the root, we do need a profound conversion of hearts, and we need everyone to engage in concrete action. The question is, how do we inspire this conversion of hearts? My main idea, if you remember anything from tonight, is that the only way Catholics as the collective body of Christ will experience a profound conversion of hearts is if we enter empathetically into the traumatic reality of clergy sexual abuse and its impact on survivors. We must be willing to confront understand and mourn the degree of evil and trauma present in clergy perpetrated sexual abuse. Only then can we begin to envision what justice means and entails. My intuition that this is a crucial step is grounded in the Catholic theological wisdom that just as we are called to be present and witness to the passion of Christ to experience the resurrection, we must witness to the trauma of survivors in order to bring about healing and new life within the church. My lecture is gonna proceed in four parts. First, we are going to examine the negative impact of clergy sexual abuse on survivors, then the negative impact on the church. After this, we are going to focus on how can we heal the body of Christ by envisioning a just response, and then I'm gonna return us to reality and examine global current response to this crisis. For those of you who have not been able to study trauma, trauma is a state of being negatively overwhelmed physically and psychologically. It is the experience of terror, loss of control, and utter helplessness during a stressful event that threatens one's physical and psychological integrity. I'm going to be focusing in my presentation on survivors who were abused by clergy as children, and I don't do this to minimize the traumatic effects on adults. I do this because there are different effects developmentally if you are abused as a child, and so I would like to focus on that, but please keep in mind that everything I'm going to say really also applies to all adult survivors. When sexual abuse is occurring, the only way a person can survive that experience is to dissociate. And dissociation means that your body separates and splits off elements of the traumatic experience, emotions, thoughts, sensations, and meaning, into shattered fragments that defy conscious integration. Now, if abuse happens repeatedly, more than once, Another, dis another defense mechanism that kicks in is self-blame and self-hatred. Children, even if they do not have conscious memories of the abuse, if it's completely dissociated, they still internalize that there is something intrinsically bad about them. They might not know why, uh, but, but some ha have a sense that, you know, something that it's, it's about me that has caused a trusted adult to act this way. Such distorted thoughts cause them to experience shame, guilt, and self-denigration, and this follows them throughout their lives. Now, while dissociation and self-blame enable a child or an adult to survive and function day to day, it usually results in very paralyzing post-traumatic stress symptoms, and here are just a few of these examples. Trauma survivors, and this is all trauma victims, re-experience the traumatic event in the form of flashbacks, nightmares, and intense bodily or emotional sensations. Trauma victims alternate between hyperarousal, which is, you know, your whole sense of safety has been shattered. So all stimuli, stimuli uh, you react to it as though it's a threat to your safety. Your body can't handle being in that state of hyperarousal 24 hours a day, so then your body 
uh, it like turns off and you feel absolutely emotional numb, numb. When this doesn't happen naturally, children will rely on alcohol and drugs. They will rely on autonomic forms of arousal like self-mutilation, compulsive risk-taking to just get relief from the hyperarousal. Uh, third, another uh, really important part to understand is because the trauma has been dissociated and you have not resolved it, for some reason the trauma victims reenact the trauma compulsively. And this takes the form of behaving self-destructively, harming others, and or becoming re-victimized. I cannot tell you all of the negative effects. Um, they're in my book, God and the Victim, if you, if you want a full account. But I just want to mention that in terms of physical effects, there is not one element of one's body that is not affected by sexual abuse. Um, all sexual abuse survivors, including adults, are at increased risk for chronic diseases, they're at high risk for panic disorders and anxiety and major dis depressive disorders. Since many survivors seek to control PTSD and all of these negative emotions by self-medicating with alcohol and drugs, they are at very high risk for developing addiction. They are also at, at very high risk for suicidal ideation and suicide. So what I would like to you know, focus on is um, having us appreciate that clergy sexual abuse and all of the effects disrupt and undermine every single aspect of a survivor's identity, their sense of agency over their lives, and their ability to form healthy relationships with others. It's heartbreaking to review the literature on clergy sexual abuse survivors. And interestingly, there's, there's really a neglect of researching women. Uh, so much of what I'm going to say is, is from male clergy sexual abuse survivors. They experience intense shame and self-blame about being abused by a priest. And this creates very deep feelings of being worthless and unlovable. This makes it very difficult for survivors to identify with others, fit in, and just be social. Being abused by others in intimate relationships is also a common theme among survivors. While all sexual abuse is traumatic, what the latest research is finding is that uh, abuse survivors who are Catholic experience distinctive forms of spiritual harm. And why is this? When men are ordained as priests, Catholics do not believe that this ritual is simply symbolic. Catholicism, especially in the last 30 to 40 years, emphasizes that ordination confers an ontological change in men, altering their very being so they act in persona Christi. They act as Christ would. Christ acts through the clergy, mediating divine grace to the laity through the sacraments. Sacraments offer forgiveness and healing to believers, making salvation possible. So this is high stakes. It's important to try to understand all the layers of violation that takes place in Catholic clergy sexual abuse. There's the violation of one's sexuality and embodiment and basic sense of, 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 of security in the world. There's a violation of a trusted relationship there's a violation of a sacred trust in a priest who represents God. And this violates one's whole understanding and experience of the church as a sacred institution. Finally, there's a violation of a set of sacred rituals that confer grace and enable one's salvation. You know, many survivors were abused in the, in the church, um, in the confessional. So if I were to summarize, although I wish I could do more, um, clergy sexual abuse robs survivors of their faith in God, their church community, their source of spiritual support, and being able to worship, attend mass, and receive sacraments. For many, sacrament, uh, many survivors, it's too re-traumatizing to even enter a church. If this were not enough for one person to 
grapple with, it's also important for all of us in this room to understand that the degree of traumatization and psychological and spiritual injury a trauma survivor experiences is dependent not only on the severity of the traumatic event, but on the quality of support a survivor receives after disclosing abuse. Unsupportive and hostile responses by other people and institutions create a new layer of traumatization called secondary victimization. And for many survivors, they have said that the unsupportive responses have been even more traumatizing than the abuse itself. You hear this from sexual assault undergraduates uh, who feel betrayed by their institution, um, from persons in the military. Uh, I mean, it's in all organizations. And this kind of victimization increases PTSD symptoms. It increases already depression and anxiety. And most, it, what is most scary, it, it really increases suicide. There are three other insights that are really important from trauma studies to understand before we can even start thinking about a just response. When dissociation occurs during trauma, the process of remembering, because everything's split off, re it requires a, a basic sense of safety and usually the presence of a supportive relationship. The process also of forming a coherent understanding of what has happened to you and grieving all the losses also requires supportive listeners. This is how deeply interrelational we are. I mean, even to be able to remember traumatic events and to be able to grieve requires loving, supportive relationships. A third thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that Victims require a safe environment and they need to have a sense of trust in others before they are willing to report sexual abuse to authorities. So these are key to understanding the reality of clergy sexual abuse. I want you to imagine globally all of the children, women, and men who have been abused by clergy throughout history and, and in the present and who have never felt safe enough to remember the abuse and be able to report it. I become frustrated when I hear Catholic leaders and even academics state with some certainty that we know the prevalence of clergy perpetrators in the US and we know pretty much how many victims there have been, that we now have sufficient measures in place to respond to abuse allegations, support survivors, and protect our children. We've, we've, we've done all of this, we can move on. Um, this is a complete lie. The truth is that perpetrators are excellent at preying on the most vulnerable children and adults. They prey on those who are ethnic minorities, who are poor and marginalized, and those who have the least resources and support. I am sure many of you are aware of the deaf clergy sexual abuse victims who have been protesting at the Vatican, um, who were abused by clergy. This is just one example. So in, in, in our US context, we have no idea how many Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and undocumented immigrants have been and are being sexually abused by Catholic clergy. According to Hispanic scholars right now, there is still a cultural taboo against disclosing abuse due to the deeply ingrained beliefs that one does not question or accuse clergy of any kind of behavior. Uh, it goes against the basic code of respect. So we, have, we, we, we do not know yet how many victims have been abused in the US and globally. Now, as I go through this, the, you know, just these effects of trauma, I feel incredibly inadequate because uh, in terms of this is not enough. Um, I'm not pretending that this enables all of us to enter into the traumatic reality of clergy sexual abuse. I haven't done justice to what survivors have experienced. What we need to do is to form relationships with survivors and we need to ask them what does it mean to be in solidarity with you? Uh, and um, 
some Catholics have done this. Some Catholics have devoted their lives to this. Uh, but they constitute the minority. In order for real change to occur, occur we need a critical mass of Catholics uh, doing this. All right, so now we're on to part two, the impact of clergy sexual abuse on the church and its mission. So I'm going to start us off with Pope Francis again. We need to recognize with humility and courage that we stand face to face with the mystery of evil, which strikes most violently against the most vulnerable, for they are an image of Jesus. For this reason, the church feels called to combat this evil that strikes at the very heart of her mission. In order to understand the power of Francis's words, I would like to just try to review the basic Catholic story about God, humanity, and salvation. And I'll try to do this in one minute, okay? So, <laughs> God creates us out of love. God loves us into being. And then God wants to reveal God's self and share God's self with each and every one of us. And in doing so, God is asking us, do you want to be in communion with me and all others? <clears throat> because we are finite historical beings, we, in order to experience God's love, it needs to be mediated. Uh, God is seeking to reveal God's self through creation all the time to us, through nature, uh, through Christ. Catholics believe Christ is the clearest manifestation of who God is. And then through the church um, and also through supportive relationships. So the, this offer of God's self is, is grace itself. And this enables us and our freedom to choose if we want to live out a yes to God or a no. And in the Catholic tradition, it's really important to know that words really don't matter. If I say, I believe in Jesus Christ, um, that, that's not, that, that is not a yes to God. We need to live out our yes, and we do this through our daily actions. And so living out a yes to God is a life in which you love God, and in the Catholic tradition, we mediate our love for God through our love of our neighbor, of loving our neighbor as ourselves, of caring as much about our neighbor's interests as our own. On the other hand, we also have freedom to say a no, and a no is a me first mentality. My interests come first. Um, it's really important to note that Karl Rahner, uh, a 20th century Catholic theologian, emphasized that, so it's not what you say, he, he, he mentioned and he emphasized that there are many atheists who do not believe in a God, but who are living out this yes in, in, in ways, uh, while ironically, many Catholics, many bourgeois Christians who just accept the status quo of life are actually realizing a no. Uh, and so I think this is really important to understand. All right, so what does this have to do with clergy sexual abuse? In my book, uh, God and the Victim, I argue that if we really take trauma studies on child sexual abuse seriously, it means we need to confront the possibility that severe interpersonal harm can diminish and perhaps even destroy person's capacities to receive and respond to God's grace and freely love others, themselves, and God. The number of suicides committed by clergy sexual abuse victims attests to this reality. I have, interv I have interviewed incest survivors. I have heard uh, incredibly heartbreaking accounts of, of, of survivors committing suicide, of, of believing you know, God was evil. God was angry at them. Um, I, I, it's heartbreaking. So within the context of clergy sexual abuse, it is not that God has abandoned the victims. God is seeking to mediate God's love in all different ways. But the degree of evil and harm present in clergy sexual abuse is blocking the mediation of, of grace. And when the church or fellow Catholics respond in hostile or unsupportive ways, that further blocks the mediation of grace. 
So it is no wonder that survivors feel an utter loss of God. Right now, the body of Christ is broken. Each time a clergy perpetrator sexually abuses a girl or a boy, a woman or a man, he wounds further the body of Christ. When the church and fellow Catholics react unsupportively and re-traumatize survivors, the body of Christ is further fragmented. I'm just going to give you a moment, you know, to, to think, to take in this picture. It is really difficult to think about this, but we need to confront the reality that when clergy perpetrators sexually abuse victims, they are also sexually abusing the body of Jesus Christ. Christ says, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. I'm going to repeat this because it's hard to take in. When clergy perpetrators sexually abuse victims, they are sexually abusing the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus is present with the victims. This is how evil clergy sexual abuse is. Until the church effectively implements best practices to stop, identify, and prevent abuse and support survivors, the church's efforts to preach the gospel will ring hollow. Our ability to act as the body of Christ mediating grace will be radically undermined. Part three, healing the body of Christ. The good news is that clergy sexual abuse and Christ's broken body need not be the last word. Trauma studies demonstrate that supportive relationships are essential for recovery from traumatization. So if abusive relationships have the power to block God's mediation of grace, supportive relationships can be vehicles of God's mediating grace to survivors. And, you know, studying uh, so much about uh, child sexual abuse, it really hit me that it's revealing something deeply theological. I mean, God is seeking to bring healing to victims through nature, through the church, through sacraments. But what trauma studies tell us is that what is needed is loving, supportive relationships. And I think this gives uh, you know, our interpersonal relationships a new significance, a theological significance that we often miss when we think, oh, grace is about getting these sacraments. Sacraments are important, but I think um, something is being revealed here. Such insight into the power of interpersonal relationships carry profound ethical implications for the Catholic Church, and I don't think Catholic leaders have taken this in yet. It transforms our perceptions of what, is it, what it means to love our neighbor and what forms this love must take. Once we have entered into the traumatic reality of survivors and realized that clergy sexual abuse has the power to subvert the church's very mission, it becomes clear that justice requires practicing a preferential option for survivors and children. This means that when we are formulating and implementing all policies and procedures concerning clergy sexual abuse, we will place the needs of survivors and children first. Now, this is hardly a radical idea. It is grounded in Catholic social teaching, affirmed by popes and bishops in so many of their writings. And so I'm just going to give you just a few examples. All we need to do to enact justice is to practice what we preach. In their 1991 letter, this was a while ago, the U.S. bishops exhort Amer Americans to reevaluate their priorities. And they say, put children and families first. Analyze every policy and program, diocesan, parish, domestic, and international, for its impact on children and families. 
poor and vulnerable children have first claim on our common efforts. I want you to imagine, what would our church be like today? 30 years, you know, if the church would have put this into practice in 1991, I want you to think about how many children would have been spared clergy sexual abuse. The Vatican in 1984 was the first to, to endorse the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. In Article 3, it says, in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. In Article 19, it's very explicit that we need to take many, many measures in all ways, legislative, administrative, social, and educational, to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence, including sexual abuse. So the Vatican signed this, in they endorsed it in 1984. In light of what is at stake, if we really take seriously the degree of harm, I believe that the Catholic Church must prioritize immediate action on three goals. All right, this is not a comprehensive, this is not all of what justice requires, but this is what I think we need to do right away. Do everything possible to identify and stop current incidences of clergy sexual abuse globally. Second, we need to utilize best practices for effective child sexual abuse prevention. Third, we need to do everything possible to find clergy sexual abuse survivors. Remember how hard it is to, for them to report? We need to encourage reporting, and we need to be in authentic solidarity with them. Now, how can we do this? Uh, as, I, as I imagined, you know, envisioning a just response, um, these are just some of my ideas. First, it is important. I mean, the Catholic tradition teaches that if you're truly sorry for something, you first confess. You first tell the truth. In order to make change, you first have to disclose. All right, so this means telling the truth about everything. All clergy sexual abuse cases and all of the cover-up. And we need to say, look what we did. And we are fully committed to doing a 180 and doing everything we possibly can to do the opposite. <laughs> uh, step two, uh, the Catholic Church would need to hire hundreds and hundreds of experts to create manuals for implementing best practices on identifying and preventing clergy sexual abuse in parishes providing trauma-informed care for victims, and create parish cultures where Catholics understand the dynamics of trauma, and they can reach out, they can understand the importance of supporting trauma survivors. We also need to train Catholics to be survivor advocates. This is the oldest, this comes from a 1994 book. I proposed this idea in a 2007 article um, that the church needed to do. We still haven't done this. We also need to guide parishes through a healing process when a priest is removed for clergy sexual abuse. And we also desperately need best practices on how to ensure transparency and accountability. I am really indebted uh, to a, a 2018 report from the Episcopal Diocese in San, San Diego if you want to read a religious denomination being absolutely truthful about its failures, it's an and they use the best available research on trauma, and they come up with a plan. They say, we have failed. The, our, our clergy sexual abuse survivors in our parishes are being re-traumatized by us, even by well-intentioned things that people say. And they say, we need to fix this. So I, I got some of these ideas from them. Um, my next idea is that experts would train Catholics in each diocese to specialize and form five groups responsible for adequately responding to the clergy sexual abuse. Uh, 
There would be an education committee that would educate parishioners on the dynamics of clergy sexual abuse. There is so much to understand about how perpetrators are the most amazing manipulators. Uh, they can get a whole parish to side with them over a victim. Um, next, we would have a Justice for Children Committee that would be in charge of creating child-safe cultures. And you would not believe all of the research um, that, has, that is out there to do this. They, we, we could use best practices for preventing abuse. The compassionate care team would ensure that survivors who report would not be re-traumatized. They would work with them uh, to develop healing rituals, liturgies, um, the survivor advocates team would just be there on a day-to-day -day basis to support survivors in their process of recovery. And then the pastoral response team would help communities when priests are accused of clergy abuse. All right, now we have to keep in mind that we need to prioritize the countries at greatest risk. Children and adults are most at risk in communities where, and I'm listing just five, sexual abuse remains a taboo topic in the church and society, where victims cannot report abuse because it would endanger their lives and sever family relationships, where bishops still deny or minimize clergy sexual abuse and its consequences, where the laity are so entrenched in clericalism that they find it unthinkable to question clergy and consider that they could do this. And fifth, where Catholicism is so powerful that civil authorities ignore clergy abuse. There was only one survivor from Africa at the Global Summit last year. His name was Benjamin Katabo. And he said that in Kenya, the Catholic Church controls the healthcare system, the education system. I mean, they control everything. Uh, so th there is no safe place. Now, I want to highlight, I want to acknowledge that since 2014, this, there, the Center for Child Protection in Rome was founded. And there's also a pontifical commission. And together, they have offered educational seminars and safeguarding training to Catholics. Um, however, there is no way, um, given the high stakes in preventing more children and adults from experiencing clergy sexual abuse, um, this is not enough. Um, this will take decades and decades and decades. Um, we need the Catholic Church to prioritize training right now in all of these dioceses. Now, the, the most formidable change for every single team that I've talked about is that we need to create cultural change. And in order to do this, we need to attend to all levels in society. This is what all the experts are saying. There's a consensus. Like, for example, if we're trying to prevent child sexual abuse, you need to not only focus on you know, an individual child and risk factors, but you also have to intervene in the interpersonal level of the child's life, the child's community level, and the societal level. So there's so much that needs to be done. And this is what's so challenging. And so the societal level, um, it's called the macro system. And this includes, like, think of how much we need to change. Cultural and religious beliefs, values, social norms, the legal system, ideologies, and structural inequalities. Um, this, this requires all of us. And, and so just as one example um, of, of how we need to change the Catholic macro system. Um, one uh, thing that's really been overlooked in the clergy sexual abuse crisis is that we have failed to examine how our assumptions about children and norms requiring children's passivity and obedience contributed to clergy sexual abuse and cover-ups. You know, as, as I read the literature from 2000 to 2012, I was struck by how little attention is paid to the word child, children, as a subject, and survivors' voices were, were very overlooked. Um, it's beginning to change. But when I went to each index, I looked for child, children, and it, it was in none of these books. And it had to have played a role. 
Um, so what we need to do now is reassess our contemporary assumptions, norms, and practices and theology concerning children in order to optimally provide a child-safe environment. Um, and we need to develop a child-centered account of what constitutes justice for children. What does it really mean to relate to children and adolescents justly? Um, and this is my current book project that I am, I am working on. But that's just one little tiny piece of the Catholic macro system. All right, so if we were practicing what we preached, practicing the preferential option for the survivors and the children, these are the kind of things that we would be doing as a church. And, and these are just a few examples. We would create a universal definition of what constitutes sexual acts with a minor. Last year, Pope Francis in an apostolic letter said that sexual abuse is sexual acts with a minor. But this is very ambiguous. And so it allows bishops in their each diocese to, to interpret this however he wants to. Second, we need to implement a zero tolerance policy for clergy who sexual abu sexually abuse or cover up abuse. Um, this has not occurred yet. And you know, if you think about the, the power of the caller, and if you think about the survivors seeing priests who have sexually abused them, and they have the caller, they are a representative of God, you know, I just want you to imagine how traumatizing, how re-traumatizing that would be. Um, it's a very complex issue about what do you do with clergy who are credibly accused. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, it is the responsibility of the church to keep them with them in community, but they don't need to wear the collar. They don't need to be uh, a priest. Third, we would implement universal safeguarding guidelines that utilize best practices for preventing clergy child sexual abuse. You're going to get tired of me saying best practices, but what I found in my research is that we are not doing this. In the United States, it's been 18 years, and we allow each bishop to decide from 200 safety, safe education programs. He can choose which one he wants. And there has not been research on which one is most effective. Um, why haven't we done this? Don't we want to do everything possible to prevent abuse? Um, you know, I, I also have asked people um, in the USCCB, have you been doing research on, you know, minors are still being abused? Have you been interviewing each minor to figure out how did that perpetrator get through our safe environment programs? What are the tactics? Because then we could inform everyone and we could protect children better. But none of that research has been done either. Fourth, we would hire research teams. They would be independent of the church to audit all dioceses. Now, we do this for responding to abuse allegations, but we do not do this to figure out if survivors are getting the support they need. Each diocese decides how much it will, it will, you know, the money it will use to support survivors. There is no transparency over what is provided, um, what survivors need and they don't get. None of that is available for us to know. And we do not audit for, um, you know, how are we doing with prevention and safe education programs. So all of this, you know, would be a priority. All right, now if we were practicing this and we were asking what are the what's in the best interest of survivors we would collaborate with them and and we would we would identify the forms of support that all dioceses must offer survivors the finance budget committee would allocate sufficient resources so that survivors medical psychological and spiritual needs are met um, we would offer trauma informed spiritual direction i mean given I, I, my sense is that Catholic leaders have not fully acknowledged the deep, deep harm spiritually that's caused. Um, so we would offer, you know, excellent spiritual direction for survivors. Fourth, we would stop spending millions of dollars lobbying against abolishing or extending statutes of limitation so that survivors have the option of pursuing justice in the courts. 
In 2007, I, I wrote, you know, the Catholic Church has to stop spending money lobbying against this. They're not only hurting sexual abuse survivors in the church, they are hurting all child sexual abuse survivors in the United States by doing this. It takes, um, there, is, there are statistics for clergy sexual abuse survivors, if you look at the average around the world, it takes 24 to 27 years before a survivor reports. That is the process. That's how long it takes to get that sense of safety and be able to report. And this is only you know, a slight minority of those who've been abused. I only taught uh, several classes at Xavier um, to non-traditional students, and in every single class, I would have men, actually, uh, reveal to me that they had been sexually abused by clergy. And each one of them said, I will never tell anyone. You know, they, they, we discussed it in class, it came up, they talked to me about their experiences, but they wouldn't even tell their closest, the closest people in their families. Um, all right, so now, that, that was actually supposed to be the happy moment of the talk where we envision a just reality. I feel like I'm failing you. <laughs> but I want to invite us to imagine. I mean, there's so much we could do. And so now we're going to go back to reality. At the Global Summit in 2019, Pope Francis called for an all-out battle against the abuse of minors to confront this evil within the church on the part of all authorities and individuals. For we are dealing with abominable crimes that must be erased from the face of the earth. Amen. He emphasized that the church would undertake concrete, effective measures to eradicate this evil within the church. So what has happened in a year? In, a, in the last year, Pope Francis has issued two apostolic letters that are positive developments. In the second letter, uh, it's called You Are the Light of the World. You can look it up. It is now a law in 2019 that clergy must report instances of abuse of minors and cover up to church authorities. Okay, now, to, um, and it is to church authorities. They do not have to report it to civil authorities unless it is part of the country's uh, laws. Second, there is that all dioceses must have a system in place for abuse victims to be able to report abuse. Third, protocols are required to investigate bishops accused of abuse and cover-up. Interestingly, um, in the Charter for the Protection of Young People in 2002, <clears throat> uh, it was very, very... Uh, deliberate that it said that you were to investigate the priests. Um, the National Review Board could not investigate the bishops. Um, so now we are going to investigate the bishops. Fourth, pastoral support must be provided for victims. Okay, so that's good. I then spent many months looking for other concrete measures, and this is what I found. On the Vatican's Protection of Minors website, it has a, a whole section of worldwide activities. I clicked it. There's one page and it lists safeguarding guidelines from bishops conferences in 38 countries. Now I looked at the countries and only 11 of these are non-English speaking and non-European countries. Um, most of the English speaking countries and European countries have already had the crises erupt and so they have had to put guidelines in place. So at present, five South American countries, two Asian countries, and four African countries have um, uploaded their safeguarding guidelines. Okay, this is good, but um, you know, we have a great need for everyone to upload the guidelines. It's also important to keep in mind that having the guidelines doesn't tell us anything about whether they are being implemented effectively. Um, but at least, you know, this is, this is happening. Second, I found, um, I found some sources that said certain countries who had never reported clergy sexual abuse allegations did so in 2019. 
So, I mean, this is good news. It means that some bishops have put into a place, you know, a system for some victims who feel comfortable enough to report the abuse. So while these new laws and guidelines are positive developments, it is still questionable how many children and vulnerable persons throughout the world are actually safer than they were a year ago. Now, even if we assume that many more concrete actions have happened that the Vatican has not disclosed, there is still a dramatic disconnect between Pope Francis's call to engage in an all-out battle and the church's sluggish response to enact concrete, effective measures to stop and prevent clergy sexual abuse and support survivors. Now, you might say, Jennifer, it's only been a year. But in terms of all that I have read, it's clear that there's a troubling lack of urgency that exists over implementing the best practices globally to stop and prevent abuse and support survivors. And so I only have time to give you a few examples. Pope Francis appointed a pontifical commission for the protection of minors in 2014. And this, this group was an advisory board to propose initiatives for the protection of minors globally, and they were to report to Pope Francis. Now, since 2014, there has been much resistance to accepting and implementing many of their recommendations. And so I'll just give you a few examples. The, in 2017, the Australian Royal Commission report had interviewed members of this board, and their conclusion was the Pontifical Commission is experiencing difficulties in reaching the performance stage of its development as a result of infrequent meetings, limited resources, and structural and cultural barriers both in the church and across nations. Second, in 2017, founding member and Irish abuse survivor Mary Collins resigned from the commission. She did this because she, she began thinking that the commission was, uh, their, their recommendations weren't being implemented. Um, and so were they doing any good? Um, or were they, you know, looking good for public relations to have a board composed of some lay members and clergy from around the world? And so she stated that there had been a lack of substantive actions, and then there's been an efficacy of action that has occurred. There was no budget to hire any experts on any of these issues, no progress on establishing universal safeguarding guidelines for children, uh, the commission proposed a universal template composed of best practices, and Pope Francis approved it and said that he would he would get it to all the bishops and tell them that that they should use this. Um, but that was that was not done. It's it's on the website, but it's just there in case someone wants to a bishop wants to look at it. Um, and also, Pope Francis did not follow the Pontifical Commission's unanimous recommendation to establish a centralized accountability tribunal for bishops accused of negligence and failure to respond adequately to abuse allegations. Um, now, more recently, in 2019, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, who is head of the Pontifical Commission and who is one of Pope Francis's closest advisors, expressed frustration that he was unable to push reforms through at the top. He acknowledged that the church faces enormous structural and cultural barriers to establishing worldwide policies and procedures to deal with abuse. When asked by Emma Green whether he sees a contrast between the sense of urgency around the issue among the Catholic faithful and the seeming lack of urgency among the Catholic hierarchy, he said, quote, I think that's an apt description. There certainly is. Yes. All right, it's important for us to also be aware of what has not changed since the summit. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the office in the Vatican that, pro that judges um, the allegations, the reports, uh, and the clergy 
still retain the power to only disclose reports of abuse to other clergy. They have the power solely to decide criteria for what constitutes a credible ac accusation, and they are the ones who select who will be on the investigation boards. Um, it says in Pope Francis's letter that you can uh, hire lay experts, but you don't have to. It's just, a, it's an option. Um, they also have the power to decide if an alleged perpetrator is guilty and determine the penalties. And it's uh, very possible that a credibly accused perpetrator might not be removed from ministry. Fourth, since no clear penalties exist, bishops may avoid serious consequences for failure to report or cover up abuse around the world. Fifth, the CDF has the sole power to decide whether to grant an appeal to credibly accused laicized perpetrators and return them to ministry. So um, anyone who is credibly accused, uh, they go through an, a, an a, a trial, um, and, and clergy judge uh, determine this. And they are, if they are laicized, that means that is the worst punishment you can get. You are no longer a priest. Well, then that priest can go through an appeals process. Um, and clergy are the ones to figure out if they should overturn the appeal. Um, so the, what troubles me the most about these conditions is that these are the conditions that created a culture over the last you know, 2,000 years that enabled clergy sexual abuse to occur and for the church to cover it up. And here's just one quote from Nicole Winfield, who in late December uh, was able to go to the CDF uh, and interview them about, the, uh, about how they process allegations. And she states, the church's in-house legal system is built on an inherent conflict of interest, with a bishop asked to weigh the claim of an unknown alleged victim against the word of a priest who he considers a spiritual son. Now, I ask you, as if you are Catholic, I am asking you whether it is morally responsible for you to assent to these conditions. And what, what we need to look at is what has been the historical trend. And so I'm giving you the latest report in November, it just came out, by Karen Terry. And she is the one that was hired by the, by the US CCB or by the National Review Board to do all the John Jay studies on clergy sexual abuse perpetrators. And so she had an update for the National Review Board and this is her finding. She looked at data from all 10 countries where there, has, where there have been major crises, and she found consistent patterns of all the things I'm about to talk about. So this actually comes from her slide presentation, and you can access the entire presentation on the web. So she found that in all of these countries, church leaders had inadequate response to abuse. Leaders prioritized protection of their brothers, the church's reputation, and assets over care for victims and proactive steps to prevent abuse. Leaders also, in all of these countries, covered up abuse and transferred priests with allegations. Second, when bishops did create policies to address abuse, we've had policies in the US since the early 90s, they failed to implement the policies adequately and consistently. And third, the church lacked appropriate education and training to prevent abuse. Now, this is her final conclusions. Uh, in the US context, meaningful change occurred from 2002 to 2019, but it was slow and inconsistent. And this is her finding right now. Children remain at high risk for abuse in the Catholic Church. And this is due to the complex hierarchy and structure the complex internal processes for responding to allegations, and I think this one is the one that is most challenging. Uh, they, she believes, um, you know, all the data is showing that children are deeply at risk because of our inherent uh, system of culture and power, teachings and beliefs. She also emphasizes that for real change to occur, children's welfare must become the top priority. 
And she also states that accountability and transparency are critical for change. So I ask you, given the consistent historical pattern of church leaders failing to place the needs of survivors and children's safety as their top priorities, my moral judgment is it is imprudent and morally irresponsible for Catholics to assent to the status quo of placing transparency, accountability, and oversight slowly, solely in the hands of clergy. And I ask you to please make your voices heard. And I, I really am asking the undergraduates in this room, if anyone in the laity has some influence over church leaders, it is you. Um, the church recognizes that, that so many young adults are disaffiliating, and they are concerned about that. And so I think if, if, if young adults have ever had power in the church, it is now. And so I just ask you to, to um, you know, when I was a college student, I uh, wrote a letter to my bishop. I had some theological questions I wanted to ask him, and I got a letter back saying the bishop was too busy. So I wrote another letter, and I said, I am feeling incredibly alienated that my bishop will not even, you know, I had a really great letter. I can't say it as well as I did then. But, you know, I pressed back and I got a meeting. And I spent an hour and a half asking him all of my theological questions. And um, so, you know, you, you could get a meeting with your bishop. Um, you have that power. Um, okay, so anyways. <sighs> The only hope I have for justice is if lay experts and survivors play key roles in ensuring transparency, accountability, implementation, and oversight. All right, so we're going to end with um, one last quote from Pope Francis. And he writes this after the grand jury report came out in 2018. With shame and repentance, we acknowledge as an ecclesial community that we were not where we should have been, that we did not act in a timely manner, realizing the magnitude and the gravity of the damage done to so many lives. We showed no care for the little ones. We abandoned them. According to Catholicism, in order to demonstrate that you are sincerely sorry for past sins, you need to repent and amend your life and do everything possible not to commit the same sins again. So what is our reality today? Presently, the Vatican and the rest of the global church does know the magnitude and gravity of harm done to victims, and they have known this for decades. The Catholic Church today possesses sufficient knowledge and wealth to do everything possible to stop and prevent clergy sexual abuse and support survivors. Until Catholic leaders do this, they are morally complicit in the abusive and suffering of every girl or boy, woman or man, currently being abused by clergy. Catholic leaders' responses thus far are incommensurate with the degree of evil and harm occurring every day Every day, clergy sexual abuse victims' faith in God and the church are being shattered. Even after at least 35 years of receiving reports of serial clergy perpetrators raping children and clergy sexual abuse victims committing suicide, the Vatican is still not acting in a timely manner. We continue to abandon so many of our little ones through sins of omission, through our sluggish responses to ensure that transparency, implementation, and compliance are happening in every diocese in the world. If this lecture seems to end on notes of sadness and anger and exasperation, it's because we're all now bystanders who see a terrible and unacceptable situation clearly. Being bystanders calls for our moral responses. This, I believe, is the time and place to harness the uncompromising spirit of the prophets, the time to speak truth to power, the time to use the distinct gifts the Holy Spirit has given each one of us to protect children and survivors once and for all, and the time to settle for nothing less than transparency, accountability, and justice. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Besti, for that challenging presentation. Because of our late uh, start, we are we are pressed for time. Unfortunately, um, maybe we can have about five minutes of some um, interaction, uh, five minutes or so, with our with our guest. Can't we have more? Um, I would be in favor of that. I would be in favor of that. Uh, Dr. Chair tells me that we are we are pressed for time. So, okay. Um, we will we will do our best. Um, if I could just ask uh, for those with questions or comments, um, actually comments would be less helpful right now, maybe questions to our speaker, um, to be sure to pose a question, um, and as always, to be, to be courteous. Um, yes, ma'am. So I guess my question is, if the clergy isn't listening, and they're in charge and they hold all the power, how do we get them to listen? Uh, I've been, you know, following the Catholic bishops' responses since 2002. The Catholic bishops are acting really, uh, I mean, they're acting differently than they did um, the first decade of 2000. Today they are apologizing. Um, they are trying to regain the trust of the laity. So the laity, you know, is speaking out. We just need a critical mass, the majority of Catholics, to be speaking out and to say, we will not stand for this. Um, so I honestly think we need to organize. There are so many groups that you could belong to to support survivors. Uh, Voice of the Faithful has been present since um, 2002. So, I mean, there are groups to, to be involved in. And I, um, we need wealthy Catholics to withhold money. I mean, those are our sources of power. Um, so we do have sources of power. Uh, and I, I just, I think we need to organize. I think we need to have more protests. We need to get on, we need to have media attention um, because bishops do respond to that. Uh, right today, we have lay boards. Um, in the early 2000s, I mean, I have a specialty in trauma studies, and my department chair, um, you know, wrote a letter to my bishop, to our bishop, and said, Jennifer has a specialty in this. She would like to serve the church. Uh, he, he wouldn't let me get near anything. So, I mean, bishops are opening up in the U.S. They realize what's at stake. So, I mean, don't underestimate the power that we do have, but we need to show it. Actually, I have a big voice. Uh, I am deeply frustrated. Okay. I mean, this was wonderful, but it seems that uh, it seems that you have to go to the top first. Okay, the Pope writes the letters. So what? Identifying priests in the United States, in Africa, around the world that are willing to stand up and have a concise, concrete statement. And then we, as lay people, um, support. But doing little protests, like you were saying, at the Vatican, and then we've got some in New York, and we've got some, so what? I agree with you that there is a lot of power at the top, but I also want to encourage us to, um, we also, we can do a lot. We can, from the um, bottom up, we can create change within our parishes. We can easily learn best practices and implement um, within our parishes a more child safe culture. Like we, we can do that. Every priest goes back to their bishops, so it's um, you know top down. Yeah. My question is, um, 
with the church sluggish response, um, not prioritizing this, do you think that this is having an impact on the secular organizations that are also dealing with this um, in the United States and globally? And do you think that the church leads um, in any way? Do you think that the church is a leader in, in leading change of culture? I mean, in terms of the amount of, yeah, uh, in terms of the amount of media coverage, I, I think it, it does uh, enable, uh, you know, victims in other organizations to report the abuse. But no, I would not say that the Catholic Church is a leader in terms of how to respond effectively. Um, I think the military, the military has done a lot of research on how to respond in a trauma-informed way. Um, so in terms of, in terms of that piece, I think we're seeing more leadership from our military than we are our church. Okay. Um, my name is Father Kyle Retwista. I'm a priest of the diocese. I'm actually uh, invited by Dr. Shevland in my capacity as the director of vocations for Spokane. And uh, thank you, Professor, for a very uh, powerful and uh, provocative presentation. I just want, as I think one of the pre I think the one priest of the diocese here at this presentation, I just want to speak to those people who commented previously. Um, I would note that in 2002 I was in middle school, right? And so I would say when we are thinking about laity and gathering coming together, I think it's important for us to remember that we have younger priests, millennial priests, who um, came of age and discovered their vocation after and in the midst of this. Uh, clergy sex abuse crisis. And so if laity are looking for allies to s protect our young people and to for reform of the church, I encourage you to seek out uh, those younger priests. Um, I imagine we, among those, what? Well, uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 I well, for the sake of time, well, I, short answer is no. I mean, I, I think, um, um, but I mean, you know, speak with your Catholic friends, speak with senior parishes. Um, but the the point is this: is that um, I think one of the ironically useful things with the um, clergy shortage is that younger priests are being called up to leadership faster, it seems. And so uh, once you find them, and if you find a young priest, he may be green, he may be horrible administration in his parish because he's being asked to do too much, but for the love of God and for a church, please support him. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I pray to God that he's willing to listen. I know for myself, I am one of those priests who want to listen and want help. So thank you. Great, thank you for your comments. Thank you so much, Father Kyle. Dr. Bestia, a quick response, or are we, yeah. No, thank you yes. for coming. It takes courage to even be willing to listen for an hour. So I, I thank you for coming and for caring about this issue. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this uh, discussion will be posted online uh, within the next several weeks, as is uh, Thomas Doyle's discussion uh, in this room, differently configured from, from October. Uh, so thank you very much. And again, thank you, Dr. Besti, for your, your generosity.